Hey guys, my name is Eli Auk. I'm a student, a medical student at the University of Iowa, planning on going into orthopedic surgery. I'm going to give this presentation about high yield OBGYN topics for the surgery shelf. I've been working on this project for a few months now. Um, ever since I took the surgery shelf, I my motivation was because I, when I took after I took the shelf, the shelf I walked out thinking that there was a lot of OBGYN questions. There's probably like eight questions on there that I really just didn't didn't feel comfortable with because I didn't study OBGYN and I hadn't taken that clinical rotation yet. <clears throat> so that was my motivation for this. Um, I want to thank Dr. Hogsdall, an OBGYN attending at the University of Iowa, uh, for helping me put this together, and then Dr. Garcia, the course director for surgery here as well. So let's get started. So here's the outline of uh, um, the topics that I have, and the reason why I chose these is because, number one, the things that I remembered. Um, I wrote down like immediately after the shelf because I, I plan on doing this. And then I also talked to my classmates about what they remember seeing on the shelf. And these, this is what I came up with. So breast, vaginal, uterine, ovarian, ovarian pathology, hormonal, hormonal things, which was a surprise to me. And um, surgery related um, when it comes to female organs, urinary incontinence is a big one. And then just some pregnancy related things. So throughout this, you'll see that I formatted it in a way where you can self-quiz yourself. You can pause the video throughout this and, and test yourself. I'm not going to pause it myself, but it's a good method to use when you're watching this. So you can see, you can see the first slide is breast cancer workup. Um, I have these 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 five different methods um, used commonly used for breast cancer workup. So I'll just ask what's what's mammogram, what type of patient a mammogram is usually used in, and you can like I said, you can pause the video after that and like try to quiz yourself before I go through it. Um, so mammogram is typically if a new palpable mass um, in a patient greater than 30 years old. So that's that's a big that's a big key thing. So greater than 30 years old, you can go mammogram, and that's typically if you're following the USP USPSTF guidelines, it's going to be every two years from 50 to 74 years old. So this is high yield on uh, surgery, and as well as uh, step two, I just asked the question asking about this screening guideline. Um, when would you use ultrasound? Ultrasound is in either a pregnant lady or less than 30 years old. Um, and again, you have a focal breast um, lesion somewhere. And so the idea behind that is that when you're below 30, your breast, the breasts are more dense. So it's hard, the mammogram is, is less likely to give you good results. MRI. Now, MRI is, you probably won't see that on the shelf simply because um, it's not indicated for a routine workup because it gives high false positive rates. So if you're doing a rotation with breast, you will and you will for sure see this happen very often. But I think that's more beyond our scope. And then when it comes to biopsy, I have excisional and core. Core I highlighted because that is uh, by far I would say the more common one that I've seen. So um, this is done when again there's a focal mass and it's or and or it's identified on imaging. So if you see calcifications or something like that, um, you might need to do a cor corneal biopsy. And then when would you do FNA? FNA is, it, it, it's a little bit different. So I would, if you have the, the choice between these two, I would almost always pick corn, corneal biopsy, except for in the case where there's a cyst. If you suspect a cyst on, or if you see a cyst on ultrasound, sound, that was when, that's when you would use FNA. So if you have a simple cyst on a patient um, from ultrasound, it can be observed. But if it's getting like painful or if it's enlarging, you need to do a workup on that. And that's when you do an aspiration with FNA. And if you end up getting blood from this fluid, that's when you would send it to cytology to do a workup for any concern for carcinoma. And here you can see a picture of a simple cyst. You can see it's it doesn't have any irregularities, it doesn't have any septations. It's just got really clear borders and fluid in the middle of it. And here you can see this would be a, more of a concern for a, a, a cancer. So you can see it's got irregularities and it's also got the septations in there as well. Breast cancer risk factors, again, this is um, high yield in any specialty you go to, except for maybe like pediatric psychiatry. Uh, but risk factors, and go ahead and pause the video and see if you can think of any. So BRCA mutations is the most obvious one. Uh, it's just it's related to increased lifetime risk of both breast and ovarian cancer. Those are important. Those are the two important cancers that it's related to, and those are the ones that these patients should be screened for. And then if you just have family history in general, it's usually related to first degree 
So when I mean first grade, it's just either your parents, your siblings, or your children that have uh, breast cancer. That's when you'd be worried about family history. Another parity, so the more kids you have, uh, the less menstru menstrual period you have, and the, the more likely uh, you are to... You, the more kids you have, the more protective it is because you have less menstruations. And then, of course, if you have endogenous or exogenous estrogen, hormone replacement therapy, that's going to be related to increased risk as well because breast cancer is typically um, hormonal, hormonally sensitive. And these last three, obes obesity, um, there is est estradiol conversion in the adipose tissue via the aromatase. And you can, you can remember the drugs that are aromatase inhibitors that are given to breast cancer patients oftentimes. Estradiol is just another form of estrogen. Age, the older you get, the more likely you are to get cancer in most cases. And then radiation history. If you have any upper chest radiation in the past, you're more more risk for having um, some, time to, some type of breast cancer. So in general, breast cancer is related to estrogen exposure. Uh, so the more estrogen you have for the more longer period of time, the increased risk you are. So uh, the more the more menstrual period you have, the more exposure you have, there is to estrogen. So anything that stops the menstruation is going to be a protective factor. For example, pregnancy, you don't have, you don't menstruate for nine months, it's protective. Later onset of menstruation, so someone who had start, started having their menstruation at 10 years old versus someone who had started at 15 years old, the 15 year old is going to be less likely, a less at less risk of having um, cancer. And then early menopause is also a good thing. So we'll go through some high yield breast pathology. So we'll go benign first. So go ahead and pause the video again for these. So fibrocystic changes. So this is going to be, you can be seeing this in a premenopausal woman. That's important. And then you'll have breast pain with lumps. So you'll have buzz. So this is very buzzwordy stuff. So the buzzword for this would be bilateral and focal um, breast lumps. Fibroadenoma. It's going to be just one. You're usually just going to have one small mobile uh, mobile mass, and it's going to be be able to move around with palpation. So this one is estrogen responsive, so it's going to increase size with estrogen. So during maybe pregnancy or during during the time of menstruation, you might see that this would increase in size and maybe become more painful, things like that. But it would most likely decrease after these exposures. And then Floyd's tumor. So Floyd's tumor is basically a fibroadenoma, except for it is in a postmenopausal woman. So anytime you have breast mass noted on postmenopausal woman, you're going to need to do a workup for that almost every single time, unless they have a history of um, fibrocystic changes or something like that. You still might, you, you'll, you'll probably end up doing that a workup as well. So colloides, fibroadenoma, and a postmenopausal woman. And then you see introductory papilloma. So anytime you see green on these these slides, it's things that I highlighted as being like the most important things. Introductory papilloma, I can't tell you how many questions I've had on introductory papilloma, but I would say it's probably one of the more high yield um, breast pathologies that there are. So introductory papilloma, it's typically a small tumor right underneath the areola. And the buzzwordy things for this that's super important is that it's typically a unilateral bloody di nipple discharge in a, in a, in a premenopausal woman. So if you have if you have a question stem that has one one a, a unilateral nipple discharge, it's almost always going to be I would I would literally pick endodontal papilloma every single time, even though it might not be, but that's the more likely um, of the other ones. Uh, and then we have fat, and again, just so you guys know that intraductal papilloma is a unilateral discharge. If you were given a question about nipple, nipple discharge bilaterally, it's more likely to be a hormonal related issue rather than a breast than, than a single breast related issue so it's more more of a benign worry um then we have fat necrosis so fat necrosis is going to be again you're going to have some it's going to be a painless lump but the key word here is after breast trauma so if you have a question time about breath related breast trauma and the mammogram shows this buzzwordy calcified oil cyst it's almost certainly going to be um, fat necrosis. Next slide, we have uh, the breast pathologies that are cancerous that you need to worry more about. So you have the uh, DCIS and LCIS. 
So these are going to be found um, typically on screening mammograms. So you have your 50 year old, 50 to 74 year old getting their screening mammogram done, and you see microcalcifications with no mass present. So this patient's not going to have a mass um, that's going to trigger the workup. It's just going to be they're 50 years old, so we got to get a, a mammogram for screening, and then you see these microcalcifications. Pigeon disease, another green one. So buzzwordy stuff for this. What you'll see in the question system, they'll say almost certainly say eczematous patches on the nipple, um, or some kind of some kind of thing related to the outside of the nipple that um, there's extra growth. <clears throat> so the thing to be aware of this is that's almost always an underlying malignancy. So Paget disease itself is not a malignancy, but there's always going to almost always going to be an underlying malignancy. So there needs to be a corneal biopsy for this patient. And here's a picture of uh, Paget disease. You can see that um, the areola itself is being over overran by um, it's expanding outward from with extra growth. And then we have invasive. Invasive is going to be it's going to be DCIS or LCIS, except for it's going to be it's going to be going beyond the basement membrane. So that's really the only difference um, in this case. And you'll you would find that after doing a corneal biopsy on the DCIS or LCIS. Inflammatory is another high yield one. Um, so they like to ask, they like to give you like a picture of what could be inflammatory breast cancer, and then it could ask what's the pathophys of this. Um, in this case, this one's kind of interesting because it's a dermal lymphatic invasion, and that's what causes this orange peel texture um, because it, it, it basically just causes the edema, which tightens the ligaments. So you get this orange peel uh, texture. So dermal lymphatic invasion is an important thing to know there. And then recognizing this type of picture, you can see that you can, you can kind of imagine how this looks like an orange peel. Okay, on to the next topic. We have these various organs, uh, lower pelvic organs, um, that have different pathologies related to each. So, uterine prolapse. You'll you'll have a patient that describes a bulge or vaginal pressure. Uh, almost certainly, they'll describe that one of one of these or a mixture of these, a mixture of these related, in addition to a urinary or def defecation or sexual dysfunction. So they'll have some type of combination of each of these. Um, and then the physical exam will give you the actual answer, the pelvic exam. So um, for this case, there's, this is probably the harder part of this, just deciding what the best treatment is. Usually they won't give you, you know, each each of these different options. So they usually start with pelvic floor exercises, you know, the Kegels, expectant, man expectant management. So just kind of, it's not bothering too much, just kind of go with it. Um, and then vaginal pessary, which I'll show you a picture of later, for just uh, uterine support, and then surgery if, if those if other things fail. And then we have ovarian torsion. So these next two ovarian torsion, ruptured ovarian cyst. Go ahead and pause the slides and try to see if you can differentiate these two right now because they're definitely more difficult. These are probably the more difficult ones to differentiate in this lecture. Um, but these information I'm about to give you is what I usually used. So ovarian torsion, you're going to have some type of pelvic pain. Uh, you're going to have, an, oftentimes there'll be an adnexal mass, and then you'll have nausea and vomiting. So it's relatively nonspecific uh, findings, but um, those are apparently the more high yield or the more better representation of what a patient would, would come, come in with complaints. So this is usually a clinical diagnosis based on the history and exam. So these patients sometimes often come with like intermittent pain because these torsions, they tors and then they untors. And you can kind of picture how that would be. You would have pain right now and then maybe a few minutes later you wanted them to come back. So ultrasound would be, if you were to ask, if they were asked what imaging would be the best, it would be ultrasound. And again, you can miss these because you, you're looking at the blood flow, so you can miss, miss this diagnosis if they're torsing and untorsing. Um, and then decision to, for laparoscopy, for the, so the treatment for ovarian torsion, is based on the age of the patient and their desire for fertility. So if you have a 30-year-old or a 28-year-old or whatever that still wants to have children, you would do you would definitely treat these patients because if you don't, you could potentially lose ovary from lack of blood spray, blood blood supply. Then we have a ruptured ruptured ovarian cyst. So this is, from my understanding, this is more, more, it's a sudden, but a more severe 
focal pane. So it's going to be in your your right quad, right lower quadrant, or left lower quadrant. And the, the high yield portion for this is recognizing the history. So it's either following some kind of exercise, like you know someone playing soccer or something like that, or or sexual intercourse. Those are two two commonly seen ones with this type of question stem. And then, so these patients you're going to observe for stability. So if they're hemodynamically stable, you might just observe them. But if not, um, then you'll you'll want to do surgery for this patient. Um, diagnosed diagnose these patients with ultrasound, you'll, you'll usually see some type of fluid in, in a cul-de-sac. For these patients, both ovarian torsion and rupture ovarian cysts, you need 100%, 100% if it's an option, pick check by HCG levels, you need to rule out ectopic pregnancy for these patients. So if it's an option before anything else, get a pregnancy test. Here's a couple images. So you have up top, you have the normal, uh, normal, the normal bladder, uh, uterus, rectus, rectum, um, vaginal canal. The second picture you can see this cystocele, meaning the bladder. Bladder is protruding into the anterior vaginal canal, and you can see that on public exam. And then uterine prolapse, the third picture, you can see that the uterus is actually itself protruding downward, and that you can kind of imagine how someone can play in a pelvic pressure in that case. Second picture to the right is just a cartoon image of a pessary. So you insert the pessary, it lies in the anterior and posterior vortices of the vaginal canal, and it basically just supports, supports the pelvic organs. Okay, on to the next um, next set of things. So leomyoma, aka fibroid. This is also another high yield one. So one thing they like to ask is they'll show you a picture of a fibroid and they say, what's the origin of this? Make sure you remember that the origin of the fibroid is the muscle. So it's the actual muscle layer. It's not the endometrium or the serosa, it's the actual muscle layer. Um, and remember that these are also estrogen sensitive. So they can grow in relation to, you know, pregnancy or menstruation, things like that. So I guess from my experience, one of the main complaints of this this type of patient is they'll have abnormal uterine bleeding or they'll have miscarriages. So an older patient might have some abnormal uterine bleeding. A patient in, you know, 28, 30 might have recurrent miscarriages. So if you if they're having recurrent miscarriages and they have a fibroid, you're almost going to always treat this patient depending on the type. It, but depending on the type of fibroid and where it's at, a myomectomy uh, is most likely going to be needed for this patient to ensure that she doesn't have any more miscarriages. And obviously, it leads to blood loss, so you can, iron deficiency anemia is a big one for this. Um, and then, so these patients are typically controlled first hormonally if they're candidates for it. So if they use like combined o OCPs or something like that to stop menstruation, um, that's, that's a pretty good first line. And then surgical management, if that fails. Important to know that these, these patients have very low risk of having a sarcoma, of trans, um, transforming into a sarcoma. Here you can see a picture of different, the different types of um, fibroids. You can have intramural, submucosal, subserosal, pedunculated. So it's just a huge variety of things. Um, next, next thing we're going to talk about is Asherman syndrome. So Asherman syndrome is, it's, so it's fibrosis and or adhesions of the endometrium. And this is going to be, this is the buzzword thing, secondary to a dilation and curatage. So what, for whatever reason, if they had a dilation and curatage, they are at higher risk for Asherman syndrome. So Asherman syndrome, typically diagnosed, you know, from a patient who's had some type of procedure and now they are having infertility or pregnancy loss, or again, abnormal uterine bleeding or a nonspecific pelvic pain. So they could either ask you what this patient, like what's the diagnosis? They give you dilation, keratogen in the history, what's the diagnosis? Might be Asherman syndrome, or they say this patient has Asherman syndrome. What is the most likely thing that this patient had undergone? And the answer would be dilation, keratogen. Here's a cartoon image, normal uterus and the Asherman syndrome. You can see the adhesions connecting the endometrium inside the uterus. So next up is going to be some hormonal things. So Sheehan syndrome, um, I saw pop up on my test related to some kind of pituitary pathology. I can't remember exactly which, but this was an answer choice. 
So Sheehan syndrome is going to be in pregnant pregnant women. So in pregnancy, you're going to have the pituitary grows, um, and then after after pregnancy, you're going to have or during pregnancy, you know, you have you have birth a child, and then afterwards, you might have a lot of blood loss. So after that that blood loss after surgery can lead to not enough blood supply to this overgrown pituitary. So you're going to cause basically an ischemic infarct of this pituitary. And what these guys, what these ladies present with is, after they have their child, they are, they fail to lactate, so they're having trouble breastfeeding. Um, it's taking longer than normal for them to get their menstruation back, um, and they're going to also have cold intolerance because. So the cold intolerance is related to TSH, which is a pituitary hormone. Uh, the menstruation is going to be related to LH, FSH, which is again a pituitary hormone, and then lactate. Failure to lactate is going to be related to the prolactin, which again is a pituitary hormone. And this one's often, oftentimes compared to pituitary apoplexy. So they're a little bit different. So Sheehan syndrome, again, is like I said, is in pregnancy, postpartum hemorrhage in pregnancy. Pituitary apoplexy is, is a hemorrhage of the pituitary gland itself. So Sheehan syndrome is ischemic infarct because of the overgrowth of the pituitary. Pituitary apoplexy is a hemorrhage of the pituitary itself. So it presents almost identically to Sheehan syndrome with one very notable exception that's that it often has sudden onset headache and visual impairment so if you have a hemorrhage in your brain it's going to anywhere in your brain it's going to cause typically cause a, a headache and that's literally one of the most one of the most distinguishing features between the two if they have a headache or if they don't if they have a headache it's more, it's more likely to be hemorrhage rather than ischemic infarct and then these patients will also have a visual impairment as well so that's the main differentiating feature between the two and you're going to treat both of these, both these patients with hormone replacement therapy. But the, again, this is this is probably less important for for the shelf itself. Continuing on, we have prolactinoma. So pro prolactinoma, you're going to have you're going to have symptoms such as galactorrhea. So prolactin is what causes you know the milk let down. So galactorrhea, so you're going to have bilateral nipple discharge. And then you're going to have amenorrhea uh, due to Again, with the prolactin effects on the pituitary and the osteoporosis related to estrogen, decreased estrogen. Um, it can be secondary to antipsychotics. So if you have a psychiatric patient on an anti-dopaminergic uh, anti -dopam medication. Um, so if you look at this image, if you have an antipsychotic drug, it blocks the dopamine. Dopamine normally blocks prolactin, but if you're blocking dopamine, it's going to let prolactin do its own thing, so prolactin is going to grow. So um, the galactorrhea can be secondary to prolactin um, disinhibition. Um, and then again, just important, another, it, I mentioned this already, but it's, it's important, so I'll say it again. Galactorrhea will be bilateral, uh, bilateral nipple discharge versus introductal papilloma, which is unilateral. You're going to treat these patients with hormonal therapy first, typically. Um, and that would be with a dop dopamine agonist, such as bromocryptine and cabergolin, cabergolin. And if for some reason they have extreme symptoms, a surgery would be indicated. And that surgery would be transphenodal uh, resection. Hepatic adenoma is another one I've seen quite a bit. So go ahead and test yourself on this one. And so this is going to be, it's actually a benign liver tumor. And it's, so you'll see it in a premenopausal woman taking OCPs. Treatment for this patient is discontinue OCPs. So you can see here an image of where the arrow is pointing. That would be hepatic adenoma. This would typically digress after discontinuation of OCPs, but it could have a complication of bleeding, in which case you would maybe need to get IR involved to uh, ligate a vessel. So some typical surgery complications. This is, Again, this is a green one, so this is very important. I've seen this multiple times so ureteral injury so for this patient uh, this from what i know about this is that you typically have non-specific symptoms so it's important just to keep be, have a high suspicion of this one so anytime you've had a recent recent surgery involving any area of the ureters um, it's important to keep this in mind if it's like if this patient presents like two or three days after surgery um, it typically will include like a vague vague pain abdominal flank pain nausea, vomiting, fever, 
So again, pretty nonspecific, but you typically diagnose these with a CT urography. And then we have another surgical complication that's pretty important, typically in the breast, um, breast cancer world, actually lymph node dissection. So these are typically done when you have concern for malignancy. So they'll do the, the sample lymph node, and if that's positive, then they'll do an entire uh, axillary lymph node dissection. So two of the main two main nerves that you need to look out for are the long thoracic, which is it, which is the one you'll see when you have a winged scapula, and then the thoracodorsal, thoracodorsal, which is related to the latissimus dorsi. And then you can see the lymphedema of the arm is also a common one, and that should make sense since you're taking out the lymph nodes of the axillary area. So here you can see a picture of an example of wing scapula. You have to put, put their hands on the wall and push on it, and you'll see that it's not supported. And then here you have an image of a lymphedema. You can see that the left arm right here would be the one that's uh, problematic. Some important anatomy for for the pelvic organs of the female body is, I would say these two are probably the most important. So, impedibulo pelvic suspensory ligament. You can see there on the um, on the left on the right side of this image, the impedibulo pelvic ligament. So, on this image, the left side or the sorry, the right side is the one with the ligaments still attached, and the left side is the one with the ligaments are uncovered, and you can see the vasculature. So, the impedibulo pelvic ligament. You can see you can see on the right and then you can see on the left the infidibular pelvic ligament um, it's, it's showing the uh, ovarian vessels and so this is where you would have you know an ovarian torsion or something like that if you need to go in this is where you would go and work and then the cardinal ligament you can see on the right side you don't there's cardinal, cardinal ligament isn't listed but broad ligament is another name for it so it just kind of covers this entire area and that's going to actually contain uh, the uterine vessels. You can see on the left side, uterine artery is uh, circled. And then you can also see on the left side that uh, the ureter is is um, is circled as well. So you can see if you're if you're doing some type of surgery involving the uterine artery, which in typical hysterectomy, that's like at the uterine artery. Um, you can see that you have potential for a ureteral injury at that point with their close proximity. So next topic is going to be urinary incontinence. This is one of my least favorite subjects. I don't know why, but every time I get a question on this, it's it, it like confuses me. So um, just kind of know. I feel like if you know these points in this PowerPoint, it's gonna that should be it for the most part enough to to get the question right. So first of all, stress stress incontinence. You're gonna have um, your ureter. Okay, so this should be urethral urethral hypermobility or intrinsic sphincter deficiency. So those are the two typical pathologies or pathophysiology of them. So you're gonna have a, the patient history is gonna be they're gonna have leakage of uh, of leakage of urine with a cough, a sneeze, or a lift, or something that increases the uh, increase of intra-abdominal pressure. And you can actually directly observe this with the with the Valsalva maneuver during physical exam. So these patients are going to be treated with, typically they're going to be treated with pelvic floor strengthening first with Kegel exercises. Weight loss is another good one. They're morbidly obese. Pessaries, which we talked about earlier first, just support of the pelvic organs, secondary to, you know, like prolapse of some type of organ. And then sling procedure. If you don't know what that is, you can go ahead and Google a picture of it. It's basically literally what it sounds like, a sling around the urethra just to give it some more support. Then we have urgency. Urgency is basically an overactive bladder, and this is due to detrusor instability. Um, so what this patient will complain of is that they'll be doing something and then they'll have a sudden urge. They have to go to the bathroom right now, and oftentimes they won't make, be able to make it to the bathroom. Um, treatment for these are, again, pelvic floor strengthening with Kegels. One, one unique one about this is bladder training with timed voiding. So instead of going to the bathroom when you feel like you have to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom every hour or so, um, so you don't have an increased volume in your bladder to begin with. And another treatment for this is antimuscarinics such as oxybutynin. Watch for the side effects on these in elderly patients. And then we have 
have mixed, which is a feature both above. And that's where it kind of gets, that's where these questions can kind of get tricky because you need to, oftentimes it will have mixed as one of the options along with stress and urgency. So you really need to read this question stem carefully and thoroughly to make sure you're not missing one or the other. And then we have overflow and continence. So this is going to be, it's not, your your bladder is not able to empty completely. And this is due to detrus or underactivity or outlet obstruction. Outlet obstruction isn't really necessarily a worry for, for female patients unless there's some type of cancer, but outlet obstruction is usually related to males with uh, BPH. And then neurogenic bladder is another example of this. For example, these patients are going to have you would typically work up these patients by doing a bladder ulcers, a bladder scan, which would show a high post void residual. So they would go to the bathroom and you would do a scan and they would still have like 500 mLs of urine in their bladder. And you would treat these patients with uh, a urinary catheter. Some more causes of incontinence. So UTIs, you know, highly tested thing on any shelf ever. So you're just going to have your typical superpubic pain, dysuria, frequency, urgency. E knowing E. coli is the most common bacteria is important. Just get some antibiotics for a few days. Pyelonephritis, it's going to be the same thing as above. It's going to be secondary to UTI typically. Um, green is, or fever is highlighted in green because typically if you don't have a fever, you're not going to have pyelonephritis from my understanding. You're going to have fever, flank pain, CBA tenderness, and you when you tap on their back, and then some nausea and vomiting. You're gonna give a stronger antibiotic for a longer period of time. Typically, subtriaxone, um, IV, inpatient. And then pelvic inflammatory disease is very super, very high yield. Um, know this one for sure. So you'll typically have a patient on physical exam that has cervical motion tenderness, some type of vague pelvic pain, and then I'll, usually they'll have some kind of discharge. Um, so these. It's usually secondary to chlamydia or gonorrhea. If you suspect one, you'd test for both. And if one was positive, you'd you would treat for both. So one thing to remember about this is you should watch for right upper quadrant pain. So Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome is a common complication secondary to typically gonorrhea. So you can see a picture here of these adhesions from the liver to the abdominal wall. And then one other important thing to note for this is that untreated infections commonly result in infertility. So if you have a patient that has a history of pelvic inflammatory disease or history of chlamydia and gonorrhea, and they weren't treated for both of these with subtraxone and zithromycin or doxycycline, you have an increased risk of having infertility in these patients and a workup, workup, workup for these um, types of causes is important. And then we have some pregnancy related things. So ectopic pregnancy, again, is going to be a high yield thing in most shelves. So you're going to have the lower quadrant pain um, and then you're going to have plus or minus bleeding. You're going to distinguish, you have to distinguish it from ep epididymitis and ovarian torsion cyst. And again, this is important just because it's really a simple test. You just get the beta HCG um, regardless if you suspect any of these. And you're going to confirm ectopic pregnancy with, with ultrasound. Like we talked about before, PID is an important risk factor for this. So treatments, the various types of treatments, subingostomy, subinjectomy, and methotrexate are all are all good options. Then we have some we have molar pregnancies. I would say this is a confusing topic, but it's important just to know some some minor details which I've included here. So this will often be a patient who presents a pregnant lady who presents who hasn't had any prenatal workup whatsoever and they do a uh, uterus or a abdominal exam and they have a uterus that's larger than expected dates based on patient history. Um, and you're gonna act, you would actually treat these patients with a DNC and serial beta HG for a whole year um, just because you need to screen. You need to screen for the risk of transformation to a choriocarcinoma. So there's two different types of molar pregnancies. There's complete and partial. So complete, you're gonna have a very, very high beta HCG and then you'll have the snowstorm appearance on ultrasound. So the first first prenatal ultrasound that these patients have, it's gonna look like this. This is this is what they say that when they say snowstorm appearance on ultrasound, this is what it be this is an ultrasound of the uterus. So obviously there's no there's no baby in here, and it's just a snowstorm appearance. 
And this one's going to have 46 chromosomes. Again, just a minor fact. Partial is going to have, again, again, it's going to have high beta HCG, but not as high. And then you're going to have fetal parts present. So you will, and you will actually have fetal parts rather than incomplete where there's no parts at all. So that's a distinguishing feature between these two. And then partial, you're going to have 69 chromosomes. And then choriocarcinoma. So choriocarcinoma is actually a very important thing to remember. It can develop after any type of pregnancy, normal, molar, ectopic, any type of present, any type of pregnancy that had, you know, elevated HCG can 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 become choriocarcinoma. So these patients typically present with shortness of breath and a hemoptysis, um, and this hemoptysis is due to the the fact that choriocarcinoma likes to spread hematogenously to the lungs. So in, inevitably you need to do a chest chest imaging to make sure that um, there isn't any spread to the lungs in this type of patient. And then another slide, just, just some minor details about pregnancy. You don't need to memorize these, but I would just, I would 100% know, you know, normal values of pregnancy because they don't, from my experience, they like to test you on what's if you know what's normal. So in a normal patient, you wouldn't these values are different. <clears throat> in a normal versus a non a non pregnant versus a pregnant lady, these values can be seen as kind of scary. But if you just know the normal values, you, you won't be as scared. So for example, plasma volume is going to increase by fifty percent in pregnancy. So this is going to lead to a, a false physiologic anemia. So if you have a patient, if you have a pregnant patient and you see they're, you know, they're they have they're anemic you might be like oh shoot we better you know you know treat them with this or that but no actually they have it's probably a false physiologic anemia just because of the increased plasma volume cardiac output so typically it's around five liters per minute and pregnant pregnant women you're going to have an increase by one to 1.5 liters per minute so sometimes you'll actually have uh, uh you'll notice a heart murmur because of a the increase in volume the heart rate is going to increase by 10 to 15. The blood pressure is going to drop by 5 to 15. It's important. This is actually very important because if you have a patient, you know, who has a blood pressure of 140 over 90, that's, you're going to be concerned for gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, which are can be very devastating, devastating problems in pregnancy. So it's important to know that. So typically, blood pressure should be lower than normal. Uh, so in these patients, you're also going to have delayed gastric emptying. So aspiration is a risk. So you, you know, typically you just want to increase or increase tilt the head of the bed up a little bit, just just so they don't have risk for aspiration pneumonia type of thing. GFR is also usually a high, highly tested one, so GFR is going to increase in pregnancy, so that's going to in turn result in a decrease creatinine level. So if a normal patient might have a creatinine of one, these patients should have creatinine of you know around 0.5. So if you have a pregnant patient. You know that's 20 weeks pregnant or 30 weeks pregnant and their creatinine is one that's actually abnormal and it should be lower than that and then clotting factors are usually increased in pregnant women most noble one from my experience is fibrinogen and that's the one that you use to screen for DIC which is a, a de again a devastating complica complication in pregnancy and then last but not least you have the arterial blood gas will show a compensated respiratory alkalosis so you're breathing off some more CO2, so you're going to have respiratory alkalosis because you don't have as much acid in your lungs. Here are my sources. With that being said, I appreciate you guys watching this. Um, let me know if you have any questions. I originally planned on giving this, you know, in lecture, so that way people could ask questions. But due to COVID-19, wasn't really an option, so I did it this way. Again, just leave a comment or whatever below. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.